If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. Um, The prophet says this, But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. I'm just going to dive right in. The message on my heart today uh, is a message entitled, Good Hands. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you that your word speaks to every single one of us individually and corporately. God, thank you that uh, we know that you search us, that you know us. And while we may feel like we're searching today, God, let us be reminded that you search us, that, that you seek us, and you are a faithful father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said. Amen. Well, it's so good to be home, and there's nothing like being home and getting to spend time with my parents. My dad is my hero, always has been, always will be. And over the years, you know, as we've done ministry in Miami, um, there have been seasons in my life where I have shied away from just gushing and really uh, telling stories about how phenomenal he is because I realize that most people don't have a reference point like that in their lives. And the older I get, the more I realize I can't shy away from it. I've got to testify about it because the world needs examples of fathers. The world needs heroes to look to. They need an example. Do you believe that today? We have wonderful fathers in this house, and I'm so grateful for my dad. I've always known since the day I was born that I'm in good hands when it comes to my dad. My dad sent me a picture of him holding um, my baby girl, Waylon, not too long ago. And in, in the picture, she's in his lap, and she's just so happy. And in the corner of the picture are my dad's huge hands and her tiny hand right in the middle of his hand. And I couldn't help myself. I just thought, she's in good hands. Because all I've known all my life are those good hands. Those good hands that have placed his big palms on my head when I've been sick and prayed for me and anointed me. Those hands that have imparted anointing over my life. Those hands that every time I was in one of these chairs, it seemed like his his hands were pointed straight at me and that he was speaking straight to me. His good hands that if we were walking along the side of the street would make sure that I was on the inside and he'd push me to the side gently so that he could walk in between the traffic and me to protect me. The good hands that swept me up in our kitchen to dance with me. Good hands that throw the football the furthest and the strongest. I've always known that I'm in good hands. And that saying is is a declaration of confidence, right? When you say, I'm in good hands, it means something. You say it with confidence. Where'd you take your car? I took it over to this mechanic. Oh, you are in good hands. If you say that to somebody, you are giving a vote of confidence on their choice of trust. And from one generation to the next, as followers of Jesus, we testify of the good hands of our good father. He has us today in good hands. God describes himself throughout the scriptures in anthropomorphic terms, in human language, so that you and I can understand the God that we serve. Make no mistake, us understanding God has nothing to do with how smart we are, has nothing to do with just how hard we search. Friends, God has decided to reveal himself to us. And that is the only reason why today we know him. And he describes facets of himself throughout scripture in this human language, because after all, how could we understand this eternal God unless he painted a picture for us in a way that we could actually comprehend and then receive and then entrust our lives to? He pictures, he paints himself as as the father, as the good shepherd, as the fire, And we read in Isaiah that he shows us a new picture, that we are the clay and that he is the potter. 
And the prophet Isaiah paints the picture clearly. I'll read it again. He says this, but now, O Lord, you are, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter and we are all, all of us, we're the work of your hand. What better hands to be in today than the one who formed it all? What better hands to be in today with all that's happening and transpiring around the globe than the one who has created time, who is in charge of everything, not just the physical realm we see, but the spiritual realm, which we know is even more real than what we see today. Do you wanna be in good hands today? Well, if you wanna be in good hands, and I do too, I'm with you, we must first surrender. Surrender to his good hands. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith is a gift from God so that we can come to the place where we choose to surrender every part of our life to his good hands. I wanna encourage you today. Today, as you choose to surrender, you're surrendering to the work of his hands. And you may have walked in feeling like you gotta get, you gotta have a lot of work to do before you measure up to be a son of God or a daughter of God or a leader in the house. I wanna encourage you today. You're surrendering not to your own work or your own striving, but you're surrendering to what the prophet Isaiah said, to the work of his hands. So your work is surrender. My work is surrender, but his work is changing us and transforming us. You can work and you can strive and you can try to achieve becoming who you are called to be, but you cannot transform yourself. You can only surrender the lump of clay that is your life to his faithful good hands that begin to work and change and transform us into his image. So work, who does it? His good hands. We often think we need to do the work. But our work is every day he stands at the door and he knocks and we get to welcome him in every single morning and we get to surrender. The scripture calls us to seek. It calls us to knock and it calls us to ask. And this really encompasses every part of our day-to-day life that when we seek, that's, that's a question of our motivations. Have we surrendered our motivations to the good hands of the Father? You may be in church today, but what are you seeking every other day of the week? What are you going for? Are you seeking to fully surrender your life to his good hands? And then when we knock, that's a picture of our physical decisions day by day. I got good news for you. You showed up to church on the Sunday morning with expectation. You have physically decided to knock. And you know what happens when we knock? God answers every single time. He speaks specifically to your situation. He brings peace where it seems impossible. He's able to heal that which no doctor can comprehend. When we knock, he shows up. Come on, can somebody give God praise that as we pursue Pursue, we are assured that we're in good hands. But not only that, ask, and that's our conversations, not just our motivations, not just what we do day in, day out, but what are our, what is our conversation? That when we rise, when we lie down, when we sit and when we walk, that the name of Jesus would be on our tongue. That our conversations would be conversations of surrender. Because if we surrender, he will do the work. It's called pressing in. See, surrender is not giving up. Surrender is giving in. Surrender is not waving a white flag of, okay, this story, this fight is over. No, surrender is saying, God, let the new life of salvation begin. It's a brand new start. It's a brand new life. And it all takes place in surrender. So I press in. But understand this, as you press in, God will respond. As you press into him, make no mistake, he will press in to you. The only way to shape is to press. Have you ever felt pressed in life? Because we came here today not just to receive a touch from God, but we came here to be marked by God. 
And God never wanted us to come into a place where we corporately lift up the name of Jesus and simply be touched by him. A simple grazing of the shoulders, a meeting of the eye, a handshake, a moment of love and an, an encouragement. But rather, you don't want to walk away and forget who he is. You don't want him to touch you. You want him to transform you. You want him to mark you. And the only way that he can mark you is if he presses into the raw clay of your life. Do you feel pressed today? Because maybe he's transforming you. Do you feel pressed today? Because maybe he's doing something that you could never dream or imagine. I think about my son, Wild. He, uh, he's three. He just met him. He's got a fire in him. And Wyatt, my oldest, he's like in the top percentile for height and he's strong, but he's so kind. And Wild is in, he's like in the 20 percentile. He's teeny tiny, but he's scrappy and he's strong and he strikes fear in his older brother's heart. <laughs> And not too long ago, Wyatt came in the room and his face was bleeding. He's like crying. He's like, mom, wild. He scratched me. And I'm like, wild. Why would you hurt your brother like that? We don't do that in this house. What are you doing? And he looks back at me and he throws his hands up like this. And he goes, well, if you would have clipped my nails. I looked at him. I'm like, boy, you do not need your nails shaped. You need your heart shaped. You need not an outward transformation. You need God in your life. And so often in our lives, when we feel pressed, we want to look around and we want to go, well, if only they would have done this. If only my situation would have turned out this way. If only she would say that, then I'll be willing to take the next step. When God is saying, you don't have to wait on anything. If you'll surrender to your situation to me, I will change you from the inside out. Come on, can anybody testify today that in our surrender, transformation is waiting? But how many of us feel a touch from God in the house of God, and then we walk away, and we never truly surrender? So God is never truly invited to press in. He reminds me of James 1, for if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away and forget what you look like. I got a touch, but I wasn't shaped because I didn't surrender. I didn't press in. In order to be formed, the potter has to shape the clay. His hands reshape the very character of our lives. The good hands have to press in and change us and transform us. And pressing feels like pressure. You know, not all pressure in life is bad. There's an atmospheric pressure in this room that allows us to live. There is a pressure in your body called a blood pressure that is very important for your life to continue. Did you know in order for you to see today that your eye actually has to have the right amount of pressure on it for you to be able to see, for you to be able to hear me today, that your ears actually have to have the right amount of pressure for you to even be able to hear the word today. And some of you have cursed the pressure in your life, but it's the only reason you're in this room today. And you're on the potter's wheel but you are on your back in cardiac arrest, it feels like. And the only reason you walked through these doors is because you're feeling all the doors and the walls in your life close in. So you decided to show up because you need some hope and you're, you're gasping for air because you feel like you can't breathe, like you're having a heart attack. But the hands of God today come to you and he applies pressure to your heart, not to break you, but to heal you. He's going to turn that heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And only his hands of pressure can make your heart beat again, live again, thrive again. And you know how it happens when you surrender your hands and your life to the good hands of the Father. The others of you that walk in this room and you feel like you're bleeding out. You feel like you've been so backstabbed, like you've been so wounded. And you say that scripture that God is close to the brokenhearted, that he binds up their wounds, but you've always thought of it like a little scratch, 
like something small, but today you're literally bleeding out. But the good hands of the Father come around that wound of your life and He puts pressure. And it's not a Band-Aid and it's not a tourniquet, but it is the good hands of the Father that stops the bleeding, that heals you, that leads you to restoration. And He won't just heal you for a moment, but He'll transform you so that you carry this story for the rest of your life. And what is the story? I'm in good hands. See, there's a weight to the call of God. What is pressure after all? Pressure is weight. If you're putting pressure, you're putting weight down. And there is a weightiness to the hand of God in His presence. There's a weightiness to the call of God to to throw down your nets. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. There's a weight to the cross that you carry every single day. There's a weightiness to being anchored in hope. After all, an anchor is a weight. There's a weightiness to bearing fruit. Hope is heavy. And as we bear fruit, may we not be surprised that there's a weight to it. This summer in Miami, well, you guys, first of all, I love coming to Miami in October. I just, hasn't this week been heavenly with the weather? You may not be aware of it. Maybe you need somebody from Miami to come tell you. It's been awesome. The breeze, the leaves, we don't get four seasons. My friend took his five-year-old to New York last week and they saw the leaves turning. And before they left, they were in the park. His son started gathering up the leaves and stuffing it in his backpack. And he said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm taking these home to show my friends. <laughs> we don't have four seasons. We just have rainy season and not rainy season. But there is this other season in Miami that we have and it's called mango season. And I love mango season because everybody's got mangoes in Miami. My my yard, we have mangoes that fall and we grab them. And we uh, you are not a Miamian unless you are trading plastic bags of mangoes with your friends. People just sporadically drop by the church with bags and bags of mangoes because they cannot eat as many mangoes as their trees bear. And my friend Lauren sent me this picture of her mango tree and it just struck me so strong because there was her mango tree. She said, DC, look at this. Look how heavy the mangoes are. Her mango tree was completely bent over from the fruit that it was bearing. And here you thought that you only bent over when you faced a storm in life. Here you thought that you only bent over when the winds hit you, when the hurricane came through your life. But friend, the fruit of your life is heavy, but it won't break you. You may bend a little, but God is transforming not just your life, but the lives of those around you with the fruit that he wants to bear. But bearing fruit, it's heavy. There's a weight to what God wants to do in and through you. When I was carrying my kids, I walked different, I slept different, and it was preparing me. The weight that I carried literally in my womb, every single moment was preparing me for these kids to be running around me one day. So last night when Wyatt wakes up in the middle of the night, that's not a big deal. I've been here before. I've carried the weight. I'm ready for it. And that pressure and that weight is building something within us. Maybe today in your life, you may be praying, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But what if it's not a weapon? What if it's the good hands of the Father pressing you, shaping you, transforming you into his image? Today, you and I can declare as followers of Jesus, I'm in good hands. Today, you say, DC, I feel pressed. Well, maybe it's because God is creating some new wine in your life. Don Shree, I feel pressed. Well, maybe it's some new oil. I feel pressed. Well, maybe you're being pruned. I feel pressed. Well, maybe he's purifying you today. I feel pressed. Well, maybe he's forming something through the raw clay of your life that you could never imagine or dream. And you don't have to imagine or dream it. You just have to surrender your life. 
to the only one who can do it. You can't be shaped if you don't have pressure. So my question for you today is, what's pressing you? I think about that old song. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. We can go. We can go so long without saying it. How long between the moment we say, God, I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. Forgive me, wash me clean. How long can go between that prayer and have thine own way, Lord? Have your way. The work of your hands, not what I'm working towards, not what I choose, but God, in full surrender and humility, my prayer is have thine own way. But it's not just surrender, and it's not just the clay, and it's not just the potter. There's another really important part to the component of transformation for the clay, and that's the wheel. The potter's wheel. I had to do some research before I preached. The potter's wheel is one of the earliest inventions in history. The potter's wheel was invented so long ago, and during the process of the wheel turning with the hands of the potter upon the clay, um, as the wheel spins around and around, the clay is stretched outward, upward, and created into a vessel. Isn't that a picture of following Jesus? That we are stretched outward, that we are pulled upwards, and we are made into a vessel to be used for the kingdom of God. The potter uses pressure against the centrifugal force of the wheel to shape us. So two things are happening to the raw clay of our life at every single moment. What is that potter's wheel and what does it represent? It represents the time that you and I exist within. That with every single turn around the sun, some of you are celebrating birthdays today. Some of you are celebrating birth and that, another trip around the sun that every single moment life is moving. That's one thing that you and I are not in charge of. But how many of you know that the potter is? That the potter created this tool called time. That he's not bound by it, but he uses it. And when we surrender, he uses this tool, this table, this force that never stops spinning against the pressure and the safety of his hands. And time plus surrender to God equals true transformation in the kingdom of God. And if his hands weren't applying pressure to the clay as the centrifugal force of the table spins around and around, well, the clay would simply spin off the table. But no, the pressure and the safety of being in his good hands keeps us grounded right in the middle of time, keeps us safe. And God uses time within our surrender to transform us. You say, Don Tree, what are you talking about? Centrifugal force. Well, if you ever have ridden a motorcycle and you take a turn and somebody's on it with you. You got to have them lean into that turn with you because the centrifugal force of the turn will absolutely throw the motorcycle off if you don't lean into it. And so is it with our surrender to God that we have to surrender our days to God. That is not just a prayer 20 years ago and now we're a Christian family, but rather every single morning there's an invitation from heaven to lay our lives back on the altar of the potter's wheel and say, God, today press in. Today mold me. Oh, come on. Can we give God praise that he's waiting to change us and meet us if we will surrender? And if you don't stay centered, you spin out. If you don't lean in and press in, friends, within this thing called time, I don't want to be ahead of God and I don't want to be behind. If you're looking behind, you're not being shaped right here and now. If you're looking ahead, you're missing out on the opportunity. But God gives us this gift of being present right here, right now, within the turn. And he will use it to shape us and transform us. So what's pressing you? 
Because we read time and time again that the crowds press Jesus. That's probably the most common thing that we see pressing Jesus in the New Testament. They were always pressing him. The crowd was always around. The crowd often, their primary role is to block people's sight of Jesus. They crowded around him. They wanted to see what he was gonna do, but they never experienced transformation because they never truly surrendered to follow him. But the crowd was always pressing Jesus. What's pressing you today? Is culture pressing you? Is the popular narrative pressing you? Are your friends at work pressing you? Is the mom group pressing you? Are your friends at school pressing you? Because whatever's pressing you is shaping you. Somebody met me in the courtyard of our church uh, not too long ago, sweetest young lady. She was visiting the States and she's a part of our church from from another country. And as she visited, she was telling me, Don Cherie, I've been watching for years. And, and we got done talking and it was so good talking to her. She's from Brazil. And she said, can I take a picture? I said, of course we can take a picture. I love it. And she took out her camera and she put it to take a selfie. And I smiled really big. And as I looked at her camera to smile, I like jumped because the person I saw on the phone was not me. She had so many filters. <laughs> Y'all, I had, I had fake eyelashes. I had a chiseled jaw. I mean, it was not me at all. And by trying to change herself, she changed me. And that's what happens with the crowd is that they're trying to change themselves. But in the effect, when you get lost in the crowd, they change you. How many of you know God set us apart? We're in, but not of. We're a city on a hill. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We're the head and not the tail. We're the bone of his bone. We're the flesh of his flesh. We are different. And the only hands we want shaping us are the hands of Almighty God. What's pressing you today? I don't need anybody else's hands pressing me. But don't just surrender. But secondly, as the team comes, God's called us to surrender, but he's also called us to stay. Stay. Stay in his good hands. So many of us think, because it is the thinking of our culture, it's the confirmation of the patterns of this world. So many of us think that in order to change, that we have to change, that we have to change cities, that we have to change schools, that we have to change jobs. We change spouses. We change plans. So we're changing, we're changing, we're changing, we're changing, and we're shooting from the hip with a deep desire to see transformation in our life. But have you considered staying Because surrender takes faith, but staying takes faithfulness. The ironic thing is that in order to see change, you have to stay. Isn't that crazy? Often instead of of allowing God to press into our lives, we pull away. So the moment we feel pressure, oh no God, I'm gonna change, this doesn't feel right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change things. And we don't understand that in our desire to see change, we are circumventing the true transformation that God is destined for our lives. What would happen if we just stayed? Just when he starts pressing, we run to something new. Just when we start to feel his hands dig into the raw clay of our life, we go to something that feels more comfortable or convenient. We don't stay and we miss out on the real change that would happen if we just did. What would happen today if you just chose to stay? What change could take place in your life? How could he form you if you just decided to stay? After all, I want to remind you today, this is not the first time that he's formed you. Another prophet that paints the picture of God as the potter and we as the clay is the the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is young when God calls him. He has no important family. He doesn't have a place of leadership. He's the he's the guy that God just finds and calls out of the crowd and decides to entrust the word of the Lord for a nation that is backslidden. 
He doesn't choose the parents. He chooses a teenager. If you're a teenager in this room, God's called you. He's chosen you. He's set you apart. He's not waiting for you to reach a certain age. His word is in your heart and on your tongue for this moment, for this hour. Walk boldly with confidence that it's the work of his hands. Just keep surrendering to him. And Jeremiah, as a teenager, surrenders to God. And this is what God says to him as God humbly, the God of the universe, and trusts his deep pain to Jeremiah that his people have turned their back on him. He says in Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. This is powerful to me because I know Jeremiah is intimidated and I know he's afraid to speak and I know he's afraid to stand before all the people that are so much older than him and declare a very strong word from God to his people. But it's as if God says, as he says, I formed you in the womb and I know you. He's saying, hey, Jeremiah, before I ever called you to speak this word, don't you know that I literally formed your tongue? Before I asked you to stand and to step into a place and declare my word, don't you know that I formed your very legs that will walk to the place of declaration? Hey, Jeremiah, I'm forming something in you. You'll be known throughout history as a mouthpiece for me, but this is not the first time I formed you. I formed you in your mother's womb. And isn't it beautiful when we think about how that transpires, that these cells decide to implant themselves within a mother's womb and then her blood fills those cells and life is in the blood and blood suddenly brings life. And as those cells simply decide to stay, when they implant and they stay, Life begins to multiply and a heartbeat takes place and a blood system and a nervous system and bones take shape and eyes take shape. And let me tell you something, that baby in the womb doesn't have to run to a different womb to get its kneecaps and it doesn't have to change to another place to get its elbows. But from seed to fruition, God brings his divine plan to pass because the baby decided to stay. So what would happen if you stayed? What would happen if you just kept surrendering? If you kept trusting and you decided not to chase the newest best thing, the freshest invitation, but you just surrendered and stayed in his good hands? I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 4 that says this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Another picture, right? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but you are not forsaken. You're struck down, but you are not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies so we do not lose heart no matter what the headlines are, no matter what the situation in your family, no matter what the doctor's report is today. We do not lose heart though our outer self is wasting away with every turn of that potter's wheel. Our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look to the things that are seen but not but to as we as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen so the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal see there's a there's a weight of glory that's taking place Today, you and I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can declare with confidence, no matter what the circumstance, I'm in good hands. You can look across the coffee table to a friend who's facing an insurmountable circumstance, and you can look at them and say, I know that you're in good hands. You can look at your spouse as you pray for your children. You can say, they're in good hands. You can say it with confidence because we serve a faithful God. We can be confident of this. You know, when I think about confidence, the most confident person in my life, period, is my mom. 
She is the most confident person I've ever met in my life. So much of my life and the way that I reflect on situations, try to think about how I'm gonna approach things is how would my mom do this? She's the kind of person who walks in a room. You know her very well. It's there you are, not here I am. If there's one second left on the scoreboard, she's hustling, she's gritty, she's taking her shot. She's believing that God is able. And I think about my mom and her family. Where did this confidence come from? Maybe not where you think. My mom was born a pastor's kid. My grandpa, Gerald, he planted churches, Arizona, New Mexico, Tennessee. He was a pastor who had a passion for the lost. My nana and my grandpa, they were faith people. A lot of pastors all throughout my life, I've heard people on TV or in different meetings, you know, joke around and say that they just want to preach until Jesus comes back and that they want to die in the pulpit. That they just want to die preaching the gospel. And it, it sounds great until it happens. Because on my, my mom's father's 43rd birthday, it was his 43rd birthday, he was preaching on his birthday in his home church that he had planted. And on his 43rd birthday, in the middle of the sermon, he had a brain aneurysm and he collapsed. And that night on his 43rd birthday, he went to be with Jesus. And my mom was three years old. For three years, she had had a good father. She had had a father who had protected her, who had provided her, who had loved her. And in one moment, he was gone leaving my grandmother, who was 33 years old at the time, with two children that they had had together, and a precious stepdaughter that my grandfather had had with his first wife, who had passed away from cancer. Everything changed. My grandfather had had uh, a vision of building a church of a thousand people. And in those days, that sounded crazy, but they had built and they had worked and they had loved and God had done a miracle. They saw over 500 people every week, but on the day that they celebrated his life with the memorial, all the flags in the city, they hung at half mast. And over a thousand people showed up to honor his life. But it was not an easy circumstance that my mom and her family walked through because my Nana, at 33 years old, trying to make ends meet, the family and the church that they had loved so well didn't step up to the plate in their time of need. And not even their funeral was fully covered. My Nana no longer had a place in the church. She didn't know how she was gonna put food on the table. So wounded by her grief, but also left holding the broken pieces of her life, not one, not knowing how she was going to be able to make it. She did a mail-in certification program to teach music, put the certificate up on her wall and began to teach music lessons to put food on the table for her family. Let me tell you, if anybody has a reason to have church hurt, it's my mother, but she has spent her entire life loving the church, building the church, believing in the church, because people hurt people, but the church is still the vehicle for the gospel. And the church is still God's number one plan to bring his hope and his healing. And my mother found herself as a child. And you know why I know? Because my entire life she's told me that at five years old, without a good father physically here on earth, that her mother would still bring her to church. She didn't leave church. She didn't run from the church. She knew that her kids were desperate for a touch and a transformation of God. My mom's told me her whole life that she would kneel at the altar as a five-year-old, my son Wyatt's age, and she would lift her hands and she would feel the hands of the good father around her that God would meet her, that God loved her and surrounded her. I know that my mom became a teenager and never had a dad step in to love her or protect her or affirm her, but God protected her through her teenage years. She walked with confidence that God was for her and had his hand on her life. I can tell you about my mom's 20s, that she walked all the way through her 20s, single and secure, Never meeting a man young in her 20s to stand beside her or protect or provide, but rather trusting in the good hands of the good father. 
And she sang and declared the gospel on the Great Wall of China. And she's told me stories of being single and doing huge meetings in India where, where they told her that people were going to show up to try to disrupt the call for salvation and this huge rally where tens of thousands were gathered. And they did show up but they decided they were gonna still proclaim the gospel. And they did make a lot of noise and they did tear down part of the lighting system in the stadium. And they did throw rocks at the stage as she stood and she sang and she didn't cower and she didn't run away. But as she stood in the middle of that stage with so much opposition against the call of God in that moment, you know what the song was that she was singing? No one's ever loved me like Jesus because God showed up for her in every season of her life. And it reminds Reminds me of the confidence that we read of in Philippians 1 6 being confident of this that he who began a good work in you shall carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ I don't know what you're walking through today but I want to encourage you you can have a good family you can have a good job you can have a good reputation you can have a good spouse you can have good children you can have a good amount in your bank account but if you are not in good hands there's nothing good about your situation but on the flip side how many of you can testify you can be just given a bad report you can be in a bad situation your life can be crumbling around you as I speak. Your back can be up against the wall and you cannot see the next step in front of you because the valley is so dark. But if you today choose to surrender your life to his good hands, you can lift your hands and you can declare with confidence, being confident of this, that he who began a good work, God, let me remind you this work has never been mine. And what you start, you will finish. And what you start, you will continue to forge ahead step by step, moment by moment. I'm confident that this work is not mine, but this work is yours, oh God. This work is yours, oh God. And so when I'm tempted to jump ship, and when I'm tempted to speak my doubt, when I'm tempted to walk away, I'll remind myself that the work is not my work, but the work of his good hands. And that my job is simply to surrender and stay. All over this room, would you stand to your feet? Would you just bow your heads, close your eyes? It's a way of you just focusing on the conversation that God's having in your heart. Are you confident that you're in good hands today? Have you entrusted your life to Jesus? Do you know him personally? Because this is your moment. Everything about this community, the miracles, the life, the resilience, what you feel, it's all because of Jesus. It's not just because we're committed to each other. We're committed to each other because we are sons and daughters of God because we have the same Father. That's what makes us family. We have the same Father. Do you know Jesus? All over this room, if today you'd say, Don Shree, today I choose to surrender, surrender my life to Jesus. I believe that he died for me 2,000 years ago. I believe that he rose again, that he resurrected from the grave. I wanna be forgiven of my past. I want a brand new beginning. I wanna surrender to the work of his hands. If that's you, nobody looking around, this is your moment. Would you just lift your hands up? I surrender to Jesus. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands all over this room. More importantly, God sees your heart. And all of us together, we're going to lift our hands up from the back to the front. Will, will everyone in the room join them? It's just an act of surrender. Maybe that feels a little strange to you. Saying, God, I, I surrender my life. I give you everything I'm holding on to. I receive all that you are. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, today I choose to throw my life into your hands. I'm celebrating your rescue. I believe you died for me, that you rose again, 
Forgive me my sin. Wash me clean. I want to walk with you and talk with you. Today I know that from this moment forward, I'm in good hands. Amen. I want to give another call to people in this room. You can close your eyes again because I just, just want you to focus on God right now. You'd say, Don Cherry, the Holy Spirit has prompted me. I want to respond. Maybe it's to surrendering or staying. You know Jesus, but, but God has spoken to you today. I want to give you the opportunity to just mark this moment. And if that's you, you know what that means. Would you just lift your hands? Say, I want to mark this moment God's spoken to me, either to surrender or to stay. That was a word for me. Praise God. I see your hands all over this room. I want to pray for you, Lord. I pray for my friends. God, I thank you for this house, God, that it's not just, Lord, moments on Sunday morning, but God, it's a, it's a real community, Lord, where your work and your picture of what a family of faith looks like, it, it happens day in, day out. And so God, for people that have felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit, that, that you wanna dig in deeper, that you wanna transform, I pray that today would just be like a very deep breath of fresh air, like they can breathe again. God, as they surrender to you, God, I pray that the weight that they've been carrying, God, we know that, that you are able but you're waiting for our surrender. And so God, I just pray for every single person under the sound of my voice, Lord, that maybe they've been pulling back from your touch. God, maybe there's even been rebellion, or stubbornness. God, that today that would just be released. And in humility, we would surrender again. God, I pray for people that in this room, Lord, that have struggled with staying and they haven't been able to dig roots, and they haven't been able to see change because they're changing everything instead of you. God, I pray that you would give them the faith to stay, that what they see now, Lord, is nothing like what they will see as they look back 10 years from now. God, we don't want to just do a sprint. God, we know that this is a marathon, and we want you Lord, to be the strength in our every step. We wanna enjoy the journey together. And so God, I just pray that you would bless your people, do a deep work in our lives together as we continue to surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I love you so much.